then there's more. Look with me, please, to Acts chapter 1, verse 5. In Hebrew, the book of Acts is interesting. It's called Maase Hashlichim. Maase Hashlichim. Literally, what the apostles did. It's the book of what the apostles did in Hebrew. Acts chapter 1, please, verse 5. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Remember, when he breathed on them, they received the Holy Spirit. When God created Adam, he breathed on Adam, and Adam became a living soul, remember? When Jesus breathed on the apostles, that was the new creation, the creation and the new creation. The same God does the same thing. Breathes on them. Okay. But the Holy Spirit's going to do something else now. He's going to unite. Up until now, they had the Holy Spirit as individuals. The 120 did anyway. Now God's going to do something corporate, of a corporate consequence. Now look at verse 8 of Acts chapter 1, please. But you will receive power, dunamis, when the Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and then to the ends of the earth. It begins in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is where Satan got his biggest defeat. It is where he will get his final defeat. It is from there Christ will reign in the millennium. Let's continue. To Judea, the area around Jerusalem, southern Israel. Okay. Samaria, the mongrel Jews, those who combined Judaism with paganism, going back to Sanballat, going back to the Assyrian captivity, where a hybrid of Judaism and Assyrian paganism became the Samaritan religion. We can think of the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church much the same. It is a hybrid of Christianity with the pontifical religions of pagan Rome, okay? It is a hybrid. They believed some true things, as did the Samaritans, but they believed false things. Jesus said, salvation comes from the Jews. You believe error. Now, separate subject, we have a teaching called the woman at the well. We explain it. But you shall receive power, and then it to the ends of the earth. God begins with the Jews, then the mongrel Jews, and then the Gentile nations. Boom, boom, boom. Concentric circles. Okay. But beginning in Jerusalem as the epicenter. Okay. Then to the remotest parts of the earth, places that they didn't even know existed. Now look at this. You shall receive dunamas. The Holy Spirit unites and empowers. He unites and empowers. There are people who are monotones, who are hopeless public speakers because they're monotones. It's easier to read them than to listen to them for many people. But I've heard monotones 
who God used because they were open to the power of the spirit and spirit baptism. On the other hand, there are people who are extroverts. But all they are, really, is hype. <laughs> no real anointing. Where the Holy Spirit really is, there is a power. The apostles could not preach with power. So what I'm saying is, Pentecost, unlike regeneration, regeneration is purely personal. Pentecost is both personal and corporate. How do we understand this? Very simply, how good and how pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. Look with me, please, to Psalm 133. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. Now watch the typology. It's like the precious oil, the anointing of the Spirit, upon the head, coming down upon the head, even Aaron's beard, coming down upon the edge of his robe. Different liquids typify the Holy Spirit in different aspects of his person and ministry. You've heard me explain this. New wine, living water, here it's shemen, oil, the anointing of the Spirit. Notice the oil does not touch the flesh. Goes down the beard, onto the robe. Okay. Lord, Lord, did we not do miracles in your name? Yeah, you did. You did them in my name. But that was something I was doing. It has nothing to do with you. You're not known by your gifts. You're known by your fruit. It doesn't touch the flesh. To have the anointing, the empowering of the Holy Spirit, anointing of the Spirit is empowering for ministry. You must be under the head and attached to the body. You see that? You must be under the head and attached to the body. Remember, the Aaronic high priest is a type of Christ, a picture of Christ, according to Hebrews. To have the genuine anointing and powering of the Holy Spirit, you must be under the headship of Christ and a part of his body. <laughs> a hand is useless unless it's attached to the body. A foot is useless. Everything is useless unless it's attached to the body and under the head. That is Pentecost. The individual and the corporate. You understand? The eye is the lamp of the body. And it's teachers. They can see. Okay. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. Ephesians 6, shod your feet with the shoes of the gospel of peace. They're evangelists. Feet the evangelists. A foot is ridiculous unless it's attached to a leg. <laughs> An eye is no good unless it's in the head. <laughs> You must be under the head and attached to the body or it doesn't count. That's Pentecost. He unites and empowers. Now remember, Jesus said, well, concerning the John the Baptist said, Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. If somebody is leading a spirit-filled life, they're not going to live in immorality. Like many people of my generation, I came from the drug culture. If I had a biochemistry exam, I'd take enough speed to win the fifth at Hollywood Park. <laughs> that's how I got through, that's how I got through my exams. I was strung out on cocaine as a kid. 
not proud of it, but that's what Jesus saved me from. I didn't see it as a problem. I saw it as a lifestyle choice. I saw fornication as a lifestyle choice. I didn't see it as a problem. Society said I had a drug problem. No, I had a sin problem. <laughs> Cocaine had such a power over me. It was more important to me than anything. It was virtually my God, functionally. The only thing stronger than my false God was the true God. <laughs> it was the Holy Spirit who empowered me to stop taking illegal drugs. It delivered me from this addiction. 12-step program. Hello, my name is Jacob. Hi, Jacob! And I'm a recovering alcoholic. Hi, my name is Jacob. Hi, Jacob! I'm not a recovering cocaine addict. That poor loser is dead. I'm a new creation in Christ. <laughs> Born of the Spirit. If you don't see moral living, it is not a spirit filled life. We all drop our crosses, we all have our faults and mistakes, but if you see somebody habitually living in some addiction or immorally, or, you've got people in pulpits who are divorced and remarried with no scriptural grounds for doing so. They're devoid of the Spirit of God. Oh, God might be using them. Lord, did we not do this in your name? The oil does not touch the flesh. He empowers us to live morally. I was shacking up with my girlfriend. You can't live that way anymore. Wake up in the morning, roll the joint, take a shot of coke. You stop doing that. Do not believe the purpose-driven lie. That is not of his spirit. The purpose-driven lie says when you see somebody living immorally or into substance abuse, just tell them they need Jesus in their life. Be seeker-friendly. Don't tell them about repentance. Once Jesus comes into their life, he'll clean them up. That's what he teaches. That's what Warren teaches in his book. No, no, no. He confuses justification with sanctification. If somebody doesn't repent, Jesus isn't coming into their life. It is a formula for false conversion. Repent and believe. Save yourself from this perverse generation. A false gospel is being peddled today. Galatians 1, if an angel of God comes with a false gospel, there are anathema, a curse of God. A curse to God. I don't mean that which is obviously false, like the Roman church that says you have to atone for your own sins in purgatory. That's an obvious false gospel. I mean what comes into evangelical circles, the seeker-friendly stuff. It's a false gospel. Let's continue. This area, Loma Linda, loaded with Seventh-day Adventists. I once met the rock and roll singer in LA, Little Richard, gave me his book. First half of the book was all scriptural. Looked like any evangelical could have written it. Second half of the book, all dietary legalism. Trying to live under two covenants at the same time like the Galatians. The, the extreme access of the Messianic movement is the same. They're putting Gentiles under the law. They're lifting up Jewishness instead of Yeshua-ness. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's another gospel. Well, let's look at this. He guides us into truth, discloses the future, glorifies Jesus the Son, and unites and empowers the church. But there's just a little bit more. Let's look carefully. Back to John 16, please. 
This is for believers. Now, let's look what he does since Pentecost for non-believers. John 16, commencing in verse 8, please. When he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. Because I go to the Father, and you no longer see me, he convicts the world concerning righteousness. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Satan was defeated at the cross. He will be ultimately destroyed with the return of Christ. But he can't win anymore. Concerning sin, because they do not believe me. He convicts. For us, he guides, discloses, illuminates. For the world, he convicts concerning sin, righteousness, Judgment. An unsaved person who you share your faith with, witness to them, give them a tract, give them your testimony, preach the gospel to them, whatever. Conviction. Important term in Greek. Get this. Eclentus convicts. Now understand what this means concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. Unless a non believer is convicted of sin, righteousness, and judgment, they are not going to get saved. Understand the two big errors that derive from a wrong understanding of Pentecost. One is Pelagianism. It denies original sin. It has a sanitized version that some evangelicals bought into called Finneyism. came from Charles Finney. That's why I never quote him. The other is hyper-Calvinism. Both of these things are toxins. An unsaved person is the spiritual equivalent of a corpse. They cannot choose Christ. They're spiritually dead. It's impossible for them to choose Christ. It requires an eclenctos, an act of divine intervention. He puts a measure of life into them. He resuscitates the corpse, convicting them of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Once that corpse has been resuscitated, some Bibles translate it as quickened, a measure of life is put back into the corpse. At that point, they're convicted. Then they must choose. They cannot choose of their own merit because they're dead through sin. Jesus said, I chose you, you didn't choose me. But once the eclentos takes place, God puts enough life back in that corpse to make it possible for them to choose. You understand? Do not believe the Phineasts or the Pelagians who say people can choose Christ. Neither believe the hyper-Calvinists who say 
the Lord created some for heaven and some for hell. They actually say, they actually say that regeneration precedes faith. You don't get faith until you've been born again. No, no, you're saved by grace through faith. You must be quickened. When you're quickened, when you have the eclentos, when you're convicted, then you have faith to trust Jesus for your salvation. Faith comes before regeneration, not after it. Do not believe the poison of hyper-Calvinism. Neither believe its diametric opposite, the poison of Phineism. Neither one are scriptural. What is scriptural is eclenctos. He convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now what happens at the end of the age? Remember, he breathed on them, and he said, receive the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is never taken from the hearts of God's people. Never. The restrainer is the Holy Spirit. But that doesn't mean he's taken. In Greek, it just means he stops restraining. Christ had three and a half years. Satan demands equal time to Antichrist, and he gets three and a half years. Separate but related subject. He will no longer convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He's only in the hearts of God's people now. The church is no longer united or empowered. The church at the end of the age will be like it was before Pentecost. Waiting for the Spirit. At the end of the age, when the Spirit stops restraining, we're waiting for Jesus. That is the reason you do not see the church after Revelation chapter 3. There'll be believers, but there won't be the church as it's existed since Pentecost. you got a 10-day period between the ascension and Pentecost. That is the spring equivalent of the 10-day period between the Feast of Trumpets and the Feast of Atonement, Day of Atonement, of, uh, of Yom Kippur, but Rosh Hashanah they call it now for the trumpets, but that's not the biblical name, and the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. There's a 10-day period called the Yamim Hanoraim. I'm thinking in Hebrew, <laughs> I'm trying to put it into English. The Day of Atonement is preceded by a 10-day period from the Feast of, of Trumpets, today called Yom Kippur. Well, you got that 10-day period in the spring, and you got such a 10-day period in the autumn. These are terrible days. The apostles were powerless. They were just waiting. At the end, the church will be powerless. Work while you have the night uh, light. Night will come, no man can work. Okay? <laughs> Just do it while you can. It's going to stop. Now, again, I only mention these things in passing. He convicts. He will stop doing this. When this happens and the church is removed, we have Pentecost future. God then turns his purposes back to Israel and the Jews. The doctrine of tribulation saints is greatly overstated. Almost everything the scripture tells us in both testaments. Once the faithful church is removed, once the parousia happens, the purposes of God are refocused on Israel and the Jews primarily. The time of the Gentiles is over. Okay? The age of the church is over. Now, the autumn holy days are going to be fulfilled. Okay? That's what's going to happen. Okay. God goes back to dealing the way he did in the Old Testament. The age of grace is over. Once the church is removed, it is the orge, not the ellipsis, not tribulation, but orge, the wrath of God. We are not appointed to wrath. 
He pours out his wrath on the kingdom of Antichrist, and he makes it his intent on saving the, the faithful remnant of Israel. That's what happens. Okay. The Holy Spirit does not operate then the way he does now. The age of grace will be over. Be over. Be very careful of John MacArthur now. John MacArthur says it'll be possible to worship the Antichrist, worship the image of the beast, take the mark of the beast, and still be saved. And then he stands up there, denounces every charismatic and Pentecostal. Not just the lunatic fringe, he denounces all of them. He essentially slandered Chuck Smith, contradicted his own words, what he had said about Chuck Smith some decades ago. Now he says the opposite. And he himself is teaching very, very serious error. That you can worship the Antichrist and still be saved? This is Magatha. If possible, the elect will be deceived. You see, at one time, I would have said most of the heresy and lunacy in the church is sadly to be found among my fellow charismatics and Pentecostals. Not anymore. You've got these fundamentalist cessationists who are as crazy as anybody, maybe even worse. What a thing to say. To rail against the gifts of the Spirit and rail against Chuck Smith and rail against people who are charismatic and, 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 and be teaching that you can take the mark of the beast and worship the Antichrist and be saved. They've lost it. Lost it. It's lunacy. He will stop convicting the world. He will deal with Israel. He will pour out his judgments the way he did on Egypt in the Exodus. Let's talk now about Pentecost future. We had Pentecost past, Pentecost present, Peter's Kerygma, the age of the church. Now let's talk about Pentecost future. Turn with me, please, to the book of Joel, Yoel Hanavi. Verse 28, it'll come about after this. I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh or on all mankind. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I'll pour out my spirit in those days. I'll display wonders on the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, columns of smoke, Sun will be turned to darkness, moon into blood, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. It'll come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be those who escape, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls surviving the Time of Jacob's trouble, Hatekofat Hatzorat Yaakov, from Jeremiah. Now, let's look at Peter's charisma in Pentecost, and this will be finishing soon. Look at the book of Acts, chapter 2, Peter's charisma, the first evangelistic sermon, takes it right from the book of Joel. But this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel in verse 16. This was like that. It shall be in the last days, says the Lord, I'll pour out my spirit on all mankind. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall see dream dreams. Now, there was nothing on Pentecost to do with dreams or visions. 
even upon my bond servants, with men and women in those days, I will pour forth my spirit, and I'll prophesy. And I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below. There was tongues coming as a whirlwind from heaven, but the sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it will come about that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. There was no blood and fire and smoke. The sun was not turned dark. The moon was not turned to blood. That didn't happen on the day of Pentecost. The age of the church, Pentecost present. But Revelation tells us it happens in Pentecost future. Let's go back to the 70. 70 times 7. 7 times 7. We did a teaching called the year of Jubilee. Hashanah HaYovel, we explained the Shemitah. If you're interested in the mathematics of this, I explain it in some depth on that recorded teaching. Let's look at this, some examples. We'll be finishing shortly. The Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 4. He's in the synagogue in Nazareth, his hometown. He opens the Megillah, the scroll, and he begins to read from Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, that is, he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and the eyes of all were fixed on him when he sat down. Why? Well, some of you obviously know why. Let's look at Isaiah 61, in case you don't know why. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news, the gospel, to the afflicted. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, freedom to the prisoners to proclaim the favorable year of God and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. He only read the first half of verse 2. And instead of completing the verse, he closed the book. He rolled up the scroll and sat down. Why didn't he finish reading it? Because to bring vengeance, that is the orge the wrath of God. That's his purpose in his second coming, not his first. He only reads what he's going to fulfill up to then. The rest still has to happen. Let's look at another example. Turn with me, please, again to the Gospel of St. John. In Hebrew, John 19 Verse 37, he's hanging on the cross, and again another scripture, they shall look upon him who they have pierced. Well, it quotes from Zechariah chapter 12. We've got the same problem. Look at Zechariah chapter 12. Verse 10, they'll look upon me who they have pierced. And mourn as one mourns for an only son. Weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. They weren't weeping over him. They were yelling, crucify him. It only quotes the first half of the verse. The second half still has to happen. Look at Revelation chapter 1 verse 7. Behold, he's coming 
with the clouds, every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be, amen. The second half happens when he returns. Zechariah 12.10, cut the verse in half. Isaiah 61, verse 2, cut the verse in half. Joel's vision and Peter's charisma, cut it in half. It's partially fulfilled at his first coming. The rest is fulfilled at his second. Pentecost to come. The remnant of the Gentile nations that survive the last seven years and the one-third of the Jews who survive, the other two-thirds won't. Judgments have always happened to the Jews and thirds, and having a Jewish-Israeli family, this is a painful subject for me. One-third of global Jewry was killed in the Holocaust, which was two-thirds of European Jewry. Judgment has always happened in thirds. It goes back to Ezekiel. Remember, not a hair of your head shall perish, but Ezekiel had to shave the hair. One third of the hair he had to chop up with a sword because the third of the Jews would be killed by the sword by the Babylonians. One third he had to burn because one third would be asphyxiated when Nebuchadnezzar burned Jerusalem. And one third scattered to the breeze, one third of the hair, because the Jews would be scattered in the diaspora. There was a few hairs he had to tie to the fringe of his garment. Now, the fringe of the Jew's garment is the tzitzit, the tassels for the commandments. In other words, the remnant of Israel, the faithful Jews, the ones who kept the word of God, the law of God, the law of God kept them, you understand? The rest either died by the sword or by the flame or were scattered. Judgments always happened in thirds based on Ezekiel, and that's historically played out even in the Holocaust. But Zechariah tells us at the end it'll be the same. Two-thirds will die, one-third will survive. And the remnant of the nations, those are the people whose descendants will repopulate the earth in the millennium and so forth. That's Pentecost coming. That's going to happen. What you see happening Just last week, President Trump unfortunately did not keep his promise to move the embassy of the United States to Jerusalem. The politics of oil. Do I pray for him? Yes, but I'm very disappointed. Fortunately, I don't trust politicians to begin with, so I don't feel really let down, but I, I pray for him. I don't identify my Christian views with my political views, but I voted for him because I voted against Hillary Clinton. I didn't. <laughs> I would have preferred Governor Huckabee or Mike Pence or Ted Cruz. I just voted for him because I didn't want the, that terrible woman. But if she got elected, I would have prayed for her. The burden of the Lord concerning Israel. The Lord stretched out the heavens. Verse 2, I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling to all the peoples around. When the siege is against Jerusalem, it'll be against Judah. And it'll come about in that day that I'll make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all the people. All who lift it will be severely injured. All. Zechariah is hearkening back to Obadiah 15. The nations who take the side of Israel's oppressors will experience the same thing Israel experiences. Islamic terror. I'll bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. Nobody has ever persecuted the Jews or persecuted the faithful church and gotten away with it. You persecute the faithful church, 
Well, you mess with the Jews, you touch the apple of God's eye. We've explained this many times. My sister's husband was killed in the World Trade Center on September 11th. I was in Jerusalem, and five minutes later, the place I was, a bus was blown up, killing 17 people. If I'd been there five minutes sooner, if I had not gotten out of there. A toy store where my wife used to take my children when they were babies, threw hand grenades into it in Haifa. My wife could have been in there with my own infant children. Uh, my grandfather was born in Manchester, England. I used to live in Manchester, England. Our ministry, Moriel, has a church in Manchester, England. And last night it was London where I live, London, England. Uh, what is this? President Obama pressed Theresa May to vote against Israel in the UN with the UNESCO vote concerning Jerusalem. All who lift that stone will be hurt grievously. Not that I'm a prophet, but I warned Britain is going to reap the repercussions of this. It is going to be an Obadiah 15 situation. This you placate radical Islam, you watch what's going to happen now, Theresa May. I'm not a prophet, I just read the scriptures. Now again, my grandfather was from Manchester. I used to live there. We have a church there. I live in London. New York's my hometown. I don't say these things lightly. I take no delight in saying these things. I've been warning for years. Islam is a judgment of God on the Judeo-Christian world for turning away from him. The same as the Babylonians were, or the Philistines were on Israel. I said these things many times. I warned what was going to happen on Moriel TV, on Roku, and on YouTube. I said, this is what's going to happen. Fasten your seatbelt. Britain is going to get hit. And if Hillary had gotten elected, America would have been hit. But you know, it's not just Manchester. It's not just London. It's San Bernardino. Six blocks from where I stay in Redlands. They were living and planning to do this. And now federal judges say you have to let people into these countries even though you can't vet them because you'll violate their rights to come in here and kill people in San Bernardino. How do you account for this madness? It is the judgment of God. He is allowing this to happen. God's not doing it, but he is allowing it in judgment. Again, I lost family to terror. I don't say these things lightly. But how's it going to end? It's going to end on Pentecost. Zechariah tells us. Once again, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, on the Yishpoch al Bet David, Gam Yerushalayim, the spirit of grace and supplication, Haruach Shel Chesed. So they'll look upon me who they have pierced and mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. They will weep bitterly over him, like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. Yes, there will be another day of Pentecost. It's not the one that the latter-day reign, lunatic fringe says, or the kingdom now, dominion theology, lunatic fringe says. It'll be this one. Those Gentiles from the nations who remain and that remnant of Israel will look upon the one who was pierced. He will pour out his spirit on them. Then the rest of Joel's vision will be fulfilled. 
It'll happen. It'll happen. The second half of Isaiah 61 2 will be fulfilled. Okay. It'll be fulfilled. The second half of Joel's vision will be fulfilled. This is the coming day of Pentecost. And so we have Pentecost past. Then we have Pentecost present that began in Acts 2. But that's winding up now. God is getting ready to turn his purposes back to Israel. The age of the church is drawing to a close. The time of the Gentiles is coming to an end. Another day of Pentecost draws near. Yeah, he'll pour out his spirit on all flesh, but that doesn't mean what these hype artists are telling you. It's something that will be incredible, but it's something that you don't want to be here for. You want to be gone when this happens. A day of Pentecost is indeed coming. But it's coming at a very, very dark time. Pentecost past, Pentecost present, Pentecost future. Hug. Shavuot Sameach. Happy Pentecost. Thank you for listening.